I remember being in the subway in China and then seeing a, a research pod. And that was the first time I'd ever seen one. And until today, it's something I want to implement. And basically this company was putting structures in the subway in the form of a pod. Then they could use those pods to do user experience based research, either on a product, on a concept or on just a question. So you'd go inside the pod and you'd sit and then they would either play a video and ask you questions and then that will give you a free ticket to the subway. So when there are thousands and thousands of people going through the, the subway system every day, imagine how much information, how much research they're picking up in those pods. Janet. Hi. How would you rate your overall well-being on a scale of 1 to 10 and why? Right now I'd say 10 because I've actually taken an entire year to self-care. Something a lot of people don't know. Yeah. <laughs> we have to go into that. Tell me more. <laughs> so um, I used to live in, in Joburg. Um, I guess due to the pandemic, I found myself in in South Africa from China and I found Joburg to be overwhelming and I found it to not be a place where I could um, dream and think and also I had the task of writing a book and needed somewhere quiet and calm and I'm a Pisces, I'm a fish, I like water. And so, yeah, I found myself in Cape Town, then getting an apartment and then staying here. And I like to kind of say that Cape Town is where I came to relax and find healing and peace. And, you know, a lot of people didn't do that for themselves post the pandemic. They just went straight in. But I actually consciously made the effort to go somewhere where I could balance and refresh, rejuvenate. And Cape Town was that for me. And what sort of things would you do to actually um, take care of yourself? So journaling. Um, I think I'm a writer first before anything else. And I write a lot. I journal. I walk. I do a little bit of yoga. Um, not as intensely as I did in China. And then lots of hiking. Yeah. Okay. And speaking about China, what mm -hmm. made you go there? to actually study? What a question. Um, what a question. <laughs> so with China, I think it would be unfair if I just answer that specific question to give you background context. But I was actually studying in Ukraine and the first war happened, the Crimean War, and I had to just abruptly leave, you know, Ukraine uh, to go back home to Zim. And upon arriving in Zim, my parents gave me three months to get out. They told me, you know, go and visit one of your friends or something, you know, and I had a friend studying in, um, in China and I had a friend studying in, um, I forgot the country, but it was a very Brazil-like country. In South know. America? Um, yeah, somewhere there. And I didn't want to go there because my mom didn't like Brazil, you know, the idea of being there for her was just a no. So my only option was literally to go visit my friend in China. And so upon, you know, going to China, I, I realized that there was a little bit more than just visiting someone or tourism. People were actually studying there. A lot of Africans were studying there. And then I thought, why not, you know, look for an opportunity to also study here and continue my studies effectively from Ukraine. Okay, and you also started working there. Mm -hmm. So how did that environment and culture actually influence your thinking? I think it was almost like going to the gym because China can be intense, you know. Um, and I had the opportunity of having really wise people around me who were working extremely hard, you know. I wasn't surrounded by a lot of young people. I was surrounded by a lot of, you know, well-seasoned older individuals who were also either Chinese or were foreigners with families 
and the dynamic of that you know you're working really hard to feed your family to take your kids to university and then you have janet who i could work really hard and make a lot of money but i didn't have a family i, I still don't have a family of my own i'm single and you know and you're working that hard you had to have an environment that helped discipline you and i think that dynamic enabled that you also did your mba in innovation management and entrepreneurship entrepreneurship mm -hmm. um and also you did your masters in big data mm -hmm. um how did that also help you um essentially pursuing um ai and mm -hmm. seeing the potential of it mm -hmm. so i think my AI journey was uh, kind of catapulted by my time at Shanghai Jiao Tong University. Because um, another thing that a lot of people don't know is I actually studied my MBA at the same time with my master's. Yes. Wow. So I have always had this bias um, because I had a lot of Nigerian friends as well when I started uni. And they used to share, you know, in Nigeria, if you have a bachelor's degree, it means nothing. You know, everybody's a doctor, they have PhDs. And I thought, oh, wow. And same thing in Zim, there are a lot of educated people. So the bar is very high in terms of academia. I thought, now I have this bachelor's degree, no one is going to hire me if there are all these like, PhDs and master's students out there. And so the bias I had, you know, personally, um, was leaned towards that. And so immediately, as soon as I got my bachelor's, tossed it aside, applied to the MBA uh, with Zhao Tong, I was two decades younger than what they expected. And I think they needed 10 years work experience. You needed to be in an executive position. And I wrote a letter directly to the dean and somehow managed to get in to the program. But I had also written a letter uh, and applied for my master's uh, to Liverpool and got in, but I got accepted at the same time. And so I had the option of choosing one, but I chose both. Yeah, so in person, I was showing up for my MBA classes, but then online, I was starting my, my master's in big data and analytics with University of Liverpool. Interesting. Yeah. And what would happen is the classmates I had, they were at least two, three decades older than me. And um, they would become curious about, first of all, why is this really young person in our class? How did you get here? And then secondly, they'll become curious about my background. And then they'll ask me, you know, what, what did you study prior to this? You must have studied something to get yourself in here. And then I'll tell them, you know, uh, computer science and engineering. And then during our break times, they would then ask, oh, can you tell me about this and this? And I want to know how to automate our olive farm. Or I want to know, you know, we have this family business and agriculture. How can I integrate tech to optimize value and ETC? And it ended up becoming like a competition where they would outbid each other. Like, no, I'm going to sit with Janet. Yeah. No, Janet, I'll get you lunch. You know, you sit with me. <laughs> you know, these are really older guys who... So that whole process for me was like a light bulb moment where, of course, at night I was doing my um, studies online for the, M uh, for the MBA, no, for the master's. But in the MBA class, I like got a light bulb moment where I realized these C-suite individuals, you know, super sophisticated, super learned, they know nothing about how to integrate technology into their businesses. And because I just transitioned from, um, I think, software engineering, uh, a master's in software engineering to a master's in big data and analytics, I also had just started to learn a lot more information about the AI space, like aggressively. So writing papers at the time. And so I would take that information and share it based on my experience and understanding with the individuals from my MBA class. And they would pretty much say, you know what, this is so cool. This is amazing. I'm going to take it back to Italy and we're going to share it with our family office and see if we can give you a budget to actually build the recommendation or build whatever it is, you know, out of state. 
I think if you put a conveyor belt and you know some cameras and build a computer vision system, you can automate your olive picking, mm. olive sorting process. So things like that is is where I think my career really started holistically. And what year was this when you actually started researching AI? Maybe 2016. Yeah, I think 2016, 2017, somewhere there. And could you walk us through actually how you started or how you co-founded Unpack AI? Wow. So Unpack AI was a result of my wanting to find other people in the big data space or the AI space when I was studying my master's. Because I was online, I didn't have a community of students. The students that were around me with these C-suite executives were like three decades older than me and, you know, couldn't speak the same language. So I needed to find people on ground in Shanghai that actually, you know, were computer scientists. Were, I wanted to learn from other people. And because they were none, I then asked on um, an app called WeChat and then managed to find a, a guy called Ada. And Ada was running the, the School of AI in Beijing. And basically, you know, I told him that, oh, I'm in Shanghai, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, and I want to build this community. And he pretty much told me, you know, the School of AI founded by Siraj Raval, who's a big AI influencer even on YouTube, um, had like a, a little system in place that uh, had um, a Jeremy Howard's Fast AI courses that they were using for you know, the, the school of AI. So he said, you know, you can start it on your own. You can, you know, there's no school of AI in Shanghai. You can go ahead and, and start it. So he went on to then guide me. This is on WeChat. Never met him before at that time. Went on to guide me, told, told me what to do. And then I went on to start uh, arranging little events and little meetups, coffee shops at WeWork, uh, then had, you know, this community of developers and community of like-minded individuals just like myself that wanted to learn about AI. Um, yeah, start to meet and build projects and then would have one person sort of lead the group and run a workshop. But using the Fast AI material by Jeremy Howard and also using some of Siraj Raval's guidelines that are still on YouTube. Uh, so it grew into this community, School of AI. Then eventually we just took what we were doing with the School of AI and uh, packaged that into Unpack AI. And then, yeah. And what was your mission? Oh, sorry. It was actually Educate AI because we, we had a pivot moment. So we packaged that into Educate AI. Um, and then, yeah, we just wanted to teach more people about AI. So it's almost like we were a school like an informal school, like a Le Wagon, but I guess not as big as Le Wagon. Yeah, community of devs, communities of PMs that want to learn about AI projects, and then you, you get a job or something. That was kind of what we're just doing, just messing around pretty much. And yeah. the work that you were doing back in 2016, how much of that actually got implemented in China, like around you, did you see significant changes? I think the companies that I worked with did implement some of the solutions that I recommended. And there are some companies that I got to learn from um, where I think I then picked up like how to implement certain things. What I knew at the time when I was in China, I don't think was as advanced as where China was that I could say yes to what you just asked me. You know what I mean? It's like um, someone learning how to make a robot today in South Africa. Um, you wouldn't be the most advanced uh, robotic scientist. You know what I mean? Mm. But you made a robot. It's a big deal. But if you to take that same robot and take it to maybe some part of Africa, even some other part of the world, if you're the most like advanced robotic scientist, then yeah, that would definitely be implemented. So there were lots and lots of people that were way smarter than us at the time. We were like at the bottom of the barrel. Yeah. And that's crazy because it is 2016. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I remember um, getting into the subway 
in China, not using cash, just using my phone. I was using my phone as my wallet until today. I still practice that. My, I have a second phone that's like a wallet because of the whole scanning, tapping thing. Totally adopted that culture from China. But the point I want to allude to is I remember being in the subway in China and then seeing a, a research pod. And that was the first time I'd ever seen one. And until today, it's something I want to implement. But it was basically uh, this company, a subsidiary of Ant Group, uh, which is also a subsidiary of Alibaba. And basically, this company was um, putting structures in the subway, you know, in the form of a pod. Then they could use those pods to do um, user experience uh, based research, either on a product, on a concept, or on just a question. So you'd go inside the pod and you'd sit and then they would either play a video and ask you questions and then that would give you a free ticket to the subway. And when first hand feedback. Yeah. So when there are thousands and thousands of people going through the, the subway system every day, imagine how much information, how much research they're picking up in those pods. The one I got to go into was changing the lights. And I think there was a, 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 a like a ball that I like put my hand on and the light in the pod was changing. And basically it was trying to uh, track my mood, you know, based on how the, the light was changing. And that is a model that they were building on stacks and stacks of data, you know. And that is information that a, a light manufacturing company can then use to then design mood lights that could be used for therapy, that could be used for, you know, a whole lot of other things. People with, um, uh, what do you call it, when you go to the army and you come back and you, you have... PTSD. People that have PTSD could be helped, you know, with that type of light. So things like that, that are so radical and so out of this world but are so normal within the setting of the jungle of what China is or what I was exposed to on a day-to-day -day basis and because I'm someone who's very I pay attention to the small details I pay attention to even the the number plate of the Uber I'm in I pay attention to why someone you know wears their hat to the side or or why they sip slowly instead of Quickly, so those things, I, I think I picked them up in China and all accumulated and combined into the vision I have today that we're fighting for and pushing forward. And what made you come back to South Africa, being exposed to that environment where mm -hmm. it's literally Everything. was 10 years ahead? I think I'd like to say God brought me to China. Because I think I was a bit of a Noah in the Ark when I was in, you, I mean, brought me back to South Africa. I was a bit of a Noah in the Ark when I was in China. You know, I was happy there. I had just signed uh, into Jiao Tong as one of the lecturers. And I was so excited. You know, uh, a part of me had always wanted that role to be a lecturer and had just done, I think, my first two classes. Then we hear there's a bird flu. And they, told, they tell us, oh, no, just two weeks. Uh, go travel somewhere for two weeks where it's safe. There's a bird flu that's broken out in China. They're calling it COVID. And next thing, I had my sister in, in China. And I tell her, you know what? You take a flight and go to South Africa. And I will meet you there later. Because I was down for, for the, the lecturing opportunity. So my sister then turns to me and says, I'm not leaving without you, you know. When they cry for you, you need to be there. And I thought, what? <laughs> so she was very dramatic and very stubborn. She said, I'm not getting on the flight. Go ahead and buy the ticket. I'm not getting on the flight with you. So then I thought, God, get on the flight with this girl. Bring her down. And I had bought myself a flight to go back in three days upon arrival. In the day after or two days, Ramaphosa made the announcement that um, there's a lockdown. Oh, and I remember being livid, like completely just enraged, just like what? And I really wanted to go back. And it went from that to six months 
to eight months to realizing I think the eighth or ninth month my visa had expired and the process of going back would have been so complex during COVID. And then finally, I think accepting the situation and deciding, you know what, I think there's something here. And yeah, just the fact that I, I asked many people about AI and tried to get clients and they didn't even know what AI was to me was like, well, I think I should be here. I think you people need me, <laughs> you know? So I think that's how I found myself in South Africa, COVID. In a very serendipitous way, I also won't deny that it definitely was God. What made you start the AI review and Tear Labs? I think with the AI review, um, 2021, I had a friend visit me in Joburg. And I remember, you know, I was telling him I want to get into the AI policy space. And I think we got into an argument, a really heated argument about the AI space in Africa. There's no regulation. No one is reviewing anything. No one, like, no one knows what everyone is building. Like, there's a lot of pockets of innovation and there was just a lack of transparency. There wasn't also a platform where you could just go and, yeah, I don't know, look up AI in freaking Namibia and be able to to get an idea of who are the people leading the, the, the tech the tech innovation or what's going on. So just that whole, you know, gap in the innovation and tech ecosystem across the continent and also the education gap that was there. You know, you have C-suite executives and leaders who couldn't even understand what AI was. It was something new to them. He then nudged me in the form of a argument for me to be the one to review AI on the continent. Yeah. Wow. At the time, I was doing a lot of work with companies and organizations in the Netherlands you know, in the US, in even India, but nothing on the continent. Because I also had just arrived. I didn't know anyone. I didn't know a lot. And so, yeah, I think that's how the AI review as a media platform that focuses on what's going on in the AI space on the continent started. Um, I thought, because the AI review is an acronym to, to TEAR Labs, that those two dreams deserve to be in the same basket. They didn't. And so for a while, I did tell people, you know, the AI review is Taylor Labs, but it actually wasn't. <laughs> and eventually came to understand with Taylor Labs, what we're trying to do was very simple. It was to give an opportunity to young Africans or to African innovators to innovate within the hardware space within a lab, if they wanted to dream big and build moonshots on the continent, that was it. I think I was set um, when and inspired by um, Dr. Riza Mia, South African inventor. He's a plastic surgeon. If you watch this, Dr. Riza, I'm sorry, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think so. And he built a, a jet called the Pegasus jet, or is currently building the Pegasus jet, and it's a VTOL jet. And I think my mind was just blown away, and I thought, wow, if there's a South African who's building this here, but is having to send most of the hardware engineering uh, components either to his garage or to, the, to London, I'm sure there are more inventors, you know, here in South Africa and across the continent that have the conviction to build a piece of hardware that could change the world and not just change the world, but could bring prosperity to the continent. It will create jobs. We can build our industrial and manufacturing sector. We can do a lot, you know, with just one, right? Um, Another person that inspired Tear Labs is a, a guy called Emmanuel, I, I think, if I remember his name. A guy, a young guy in Nigeria built a generator that uses water to power his apartment, to power his home. 
And I thought, what? <laughs> if he had a lab, the right resources, the right funding, the right technology partners, imagine if we had generators that don't use diesel, that use water. So, you know, there are many more stories and many more inventors, but that gave me conviction, conviction that what I had also experienced in China, you know, Baidu's building an uh, Apollo 2 uh, autonomous vehicle, and I knew from day one, the first time I saw it, and I joined the team, that there's no way that was going to be like commercially ready. It was going to take years before it's commercially ready. But those years, they had the opportunity to do that because they had somewhere to build it, and there was an opportunity and platform so people could build that. So I think that's where Tear Labs came into the picture. And now the acronym for Tear Labs doesn't stand for the AI review, but stands for Technology, Advancement, Innovation and Research Lab. Okay. And firstly, I love that mission. Thank you. Um, and I wanted to ask a question around, you mentioned the word moonshot. So could mm. you tell us more about what that means to you? Mm. So for me, moonshot is a two-tiered um, explanation or definition. Moonshot, literally, the thing that goes to the moon, your spaceship, your aircraft, your you name it. And then the second definition that I think I can say is what I think of when I say moonshot is a piece of innovation that's so out there, that's so big that's so not big in size but that's so advanced that's so radical you know something that someone would look at and say you, this is like some star wars yoda type of thing you know and walk away that is moonshot to me you know the go big go home type of stuff you know um um there's a venture called x moonshot yeah i think it's google's subsidiary yeah and literally all they do is, is build i don't want to use the word radical innovations but they solve problems that most people wouldn't solve because they seem impossible so the impossible there's a lot of the impossibles you know impossible problems impossible uh, challenges on the continent things that no one wants to touch because, oh, that is too expensive. It's too complicated. Oh, it's too dangerous. I think whatever comes out of that space, I think I would like to consider a moonshot. So I'll give you an example. On the AI review platform, there's a, a piece of research. I think it's a Korean-based university or Japan-based university. Their students built a caterpillar robot just for just. <laughs> Think of mimicking the anatomy of a caterpillar and then building a robot. Students. Students. And when I read the research papers, I was trying to understand, first of all, what was the architecture around the, the caterpillar itself, the engineering architecture. But then secondly, I wanted to understand what are the use cases, <laughs> right? And there were a lot of use cases that came out of that, by the way. Um, one being in the movement of goods within a, a large scale space. Um, you know, you put maybe uh, boxes or crates at the back of the caterpillar on top of it. And then you put things inside and they can disembark. And the caterpillar keeps on moving like a train. And, you know, they keep disembarking and dropping things where they need to drop, which is really smart. It could be used for a vineyard to pick grapes or something. But the interesting use case I picked up is the caterpillar size could change and the caterpillar could be used to um, unclog uh, water pipes or sewage pipes for municipality. And I thought, well, who does it today and how do they do it? And when I went on to do my research and figure out that today a human being needs to go physically into the sewage drain, if there's something blocking the drain. I thought, what? And then when I went on to 
keep reading and figure out, okay, so some of the parts of the country specific to South Africa that are having challenges with working, you know, uh, sewage pipes and, and, and systems, what is the problem? Blockages in the drains. And I thought, if we had some kind of facility or resources where people could be given an opportunity to build specific to solving the many problems we have from infrastructure to sewage drains to whatnot, then we're going to have a lot of moonshots coming up. Because if you're to go to uh, maybe government or, you know, or the city and say, oh, can you give me a, a budget to build a Caterpillar robot to help undrain your sewages? They'll throw you out and think you're crazy, you know? But it's until someone does it, until it's done, it'll always seem impossible. That's Nelson Mandela. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Yeah. And um, yeah, just to that point about the sewer. So there is mm -hmm. a device that I also came across. It's okay. a device that has wheels and a camera on it. Mm -hmm. And also a saw. So a you, saw? Yeah, okay. something that cuts through okay. any mm -hmm. pipes. So you put that eye mover into the sewer pipes, mm -hmm. but there's still someone that's controlling it. Mm -hmm. and, and like a remote control, mm -hmm, seeing mm -hmm. where to go. Mm -hmm. But of course, once more, there's limitations in that. Mm -hmm, so that mm -hmm. caterpillar can address those limitations. Definitely. I think the point I was trying to make is, um, I'm impressed about the technology that already exists, mm -hmm. but using AI, how can it, to your point, moonshot and be mm -hmm. revolutionary and mm -hmm. unclog all the drains in <laughs> in South Africa and Africa. And I think mm. that's possible. And all the metaphorical drains as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a good yeah. point. Mm -hmm. uh, and I want to ask a question about entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, about entrepreneurs. Okay. So why is it important for them to start adopting AI of some sort in their business? Mm -hmm. Even if their business is not centered around AI tools, mm -hmm. what's the significance of that in your opinion? I think the lowest hanging fruit with AI is optimizing efficiency. Um, and efficiency could be in the quality of output or it could be in the speed, right? And um, I think if you're not taking advantage of the technology that's already out there, the tools, um, even the models, if you're a developer, platforms like ChatGPT, you know, you're slowing yourself down. The standard has changed already. You know, the expectations are changing each and every day of the human output that's expected, especially in the professional space. It's very rare that um, a full-fledged maybe proposal should take you days and days and days to put together, right? The standard has already been changed using some of the AI tools that are out there. So if you're a business and you're an entrepreneur and you want to be fast on your feet and you want to do more or do better and be more efficient, then you need to take advantage of, of you know, where we're at, the, the revolution we're experiencing. So where should they start to actually look to implement mm -hmm. these tools in their business? Mm -hmm. um, could you give us some recommendations mm -hmm, mm -hmm. on tools, Absolutely. on platforms? Mm -hmm. So funny enough, I don't think you need to really look, it's in your face. It's everywhere. If you're using platforms like um, Canva, for example, Canva is already AI integrated now, right? Uh, you can do magic design on Canva, you can, can do a lot. Uh, most platforms that we know today, even platforms like monday.com, um, they also have, it's more like a, a CRM and a platform for teams to collaborate and work on and work on together. AI has been integrated already. You know, Figma, for example. I use Figma a lot. You can now generate a design on Figma. Yeah, so a lot of platforms already are integrating AI. I think a quick Google search would help anyone find whatever specific tool or platform that they need. Because, I mean, Everything from design to um, writing text-based work uh, to research. It's an AI research platform I came across the other day. 
you can find it. And what about building? So building your own bot. Building your own bot. Um, as an example. As an example. I think there are a lot of... Um, yeah, there's a lot of work that's already been done that you can probably find on GitHub. Mm -hmm. So I play around on GitHub a lot, right? Because I know real people put the information there. <laughs> Whereas for other platforms, it's, you kind of can't tell sometimes where, where is this coming from. So the source matters um, as well. And I think if you want to build your own robot, I'll probably say go on GitHub. Right, you'll probably find what you need there. Okay. Mm. In your opinion, which industries will get disrupted in the coming? I would, if you could give me two or three industries mm -hmm. that would most get disrupted in the coming years, mm -hmm. what would they be? I think I'll definitely start with healthcare. So the amount of research that's gone into the healthcare industry is ridiculous. In 2013, I learned about the, a robotic bandage for the first time in 2023. In 2012, I learned about robotic bandages and precision like um, a surgery, you know, where there's a robotic needle or robotic surgeon that's conducting a surgery. And there's no surgeon in the room. They're on the other side of the wall, the other side of the room. If stuff like that was happening in 2012 and 2013, what more now? So I'll definitely say the healthcare sector is the first one. The second one, I think, um, generally based on how much people care about that sector and based on how much investment goes into that sector, especially for the African continent, would be the finance sector, the fintech sector. Um, how uh, money is regulated, how uh, payments are regulated. I think that's a, that's a big space, right? And then uh, my third one, I'm slightly biased, but um, I would like to say the industrial space and a niche to that, I'd probably say the agricultural space because food really matters. People will always need to eat. And there's been a lot of challenges in regards to people getting access to enough resources to increase output. And like I said earlier, AI can definitely help with that. Looking at companies like, I um, forgot the name of the company, but there's a Silicon Valley based company that's developing autonomous tractors. These are things I've been thinking about as well. You know, how do we make electric autonomous tractors? Farmer John goes to sleep, but he's harvesting potatoes. How do we do that? Can save a lot of money, can save a lot of time, can optimize output within the agriculture space. So, yeah. So I think those are the, the three main ones. And what, mm -hmm. what advice would you give to entrepreneurs wanting to enter the space? So there's a bunch of problems out there. Mm -hmm. You know, how are you encouraging individuals who think like um, the former Brown or former John example the that you use? <laughs> the yes. former Brown example that you use when he's asleep, autonomous tractors. Mm -hmm. So, what advice are you giving entrepreneurs to build things like that? You know, how, mm -hmm. where should they start? Um, what should they be doing? Where should they be looking? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, I think the first thing is um, to align whatever you're going to solve for with the UNSDGs. That's like the first thing. Could you define that? Uh, the UNSDGs, the Social Development Goals. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, um, you know, they can go to websites like AI for Good, for example, that helps to define that clearly. And then the second thing I would do is um, look at the sectors that... Um, have the biggest challenges because i mean if you're going to integrate any sort of ai either for either it's reactive ai or generative ai or or predictive ai you need to make sure the problem is big enough right and it's pressing enough for people to pay for it um, and then they need to look for ways to integrate research 
into whatever they're building because unlike the traditional startup, unlike the traditional process of building a product, it's not going to be built overnight. By virtue of wanting to build something that is AI-based, you're talking about something that is data-based, that's data-centric, and any conversation about data is expensive, right? So you want to start off, you want to make your foundation research, even if you're profitable, even if you're making money from day one, because that's going to help you to further develop your piece of innovation, whether that's software, whether that's hardware, it's going to give you enough room, you know, to be able to understand what is the underlying opportunity within the data, within the AI, you know, that you're developing. So Farmer John wouldn't go to market day one. It could take Farmer John three years, you know, to, to figure it out how to make a autonomous uh, tractor work. Um, what's the regulation surrounding the autonomous tractor? It's not an overnight job. You know, how do people work with the autonomous tractor? What are the t contingencies surrounding the autonomous tractor? So that process, I think, is very important, especially if you're on the continent. Um, in as much as I do advocate, you know, let's build moonshots and let's go big or go home, guys. I, I'm also very conscious about being uh, building responsible AI and building AI responsibly and, and building um, for building solutions that are relevant to the continent. Yeah. Okay, let's speak about that. The dangers okay. of AI. The dangers of AI. So I came across a quote. I'm going to read it to you. So it says, mm -hmm. AI is not dangerous, mm -hmm. but people using AI for selfish reasons are dangerous. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion on that? I think I sit on both sides of the fence because I think um, for us to be where we are today with artificial intelligence, it's because of people. Right. So I think we are definitely the problem to start with people. Um, some of us, I think, um, don't have the best interests for humanity at heart. And then on the flip side of that, when you create uh, a piece of technology that can potentially, mock my words, potentially get to consciousness or mirror consciousness i think that is also very dangerous and how would you define consciousness so you're a conscious being you can make decisions on your own i'm a conscious being i can make decisions on my own right does a conscious being also have emotions a conscious being has emotions uh, i don't think a machine can have emotions but a machine can mimic or hallucinate reactions that can make it look like it has emotions right so i think to some degree that is the you know that's where we're going are we there yet i don't think so but definitely if we keep just um building and training these models that is the predicted you know, future of AI, super intelligent, essentially, is what I'm talking about. Um, and I think it's only when we get there that we'll realize the true dangers of the technology. Yeah, that's why I said I'm on both sides of the fence. So does that mean what needs to happen right now for that to be prevented? Regulation. In what way? Um, regulation around who builds and what is built and in what way. Regulation passed on by the government? Yes. I think passed down by the government, which are our regulators, governance uh, bodies and institutions, but in collaboration with the private sector. Because the private sector is where the action is happening. It's where people are building, right? It's where people are investing. So the government, um, policy makers, for example, should be able to then look at what's happening on the ground in the private sector and be able to marry policy uh, with government regulation. So I'm talking about 
policy all the way to um, implementing that policy into the constitution because there has to be some kind of litigation or reprimand that would come with not following the, the recommended regulation, AI regulation or policy recommendations. Yeah. Did you hear what the Google CEO said to that? The Google CEO? Uh, so he's going to continue okay. and does not agree with the open letter and will not sign mm -hmm. because there could be a 15-year-old that develops technology mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that could potentially be harmful or not harmful, mm -hmm. but so competitive that, you know, puts there is a competition to their business. Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, fast tracks mm -hmm. and has that advantage when they have stopped mm -hmm. building. So I think I'll, I'll understand why, you know, of course, especially Google, or any of the, the, the big fives that the FANG would say something like that or say something similar to that. Um, but like I said, I, I will not comment. Yeah, especially considering that, you know, we're also working on a, on a piece of AI software. Uh, but at the same time, I, I do care about impact and, and research and responsible building. Um, yeah. Should individuals, if you're saying that the problem is humans, mm -hmm. does that mean that there should be more emphasis on developing aware individuals with great responsibilities come great power? Mm -hmm. So emphasizing that part mm -hmm. and helping individuals be more responsible, mm -hmm. would that be a solution? I think that is probably one of the most viable solutions I can think of because I don't know how reasonable or, or how viable it is to try and stop the technology but you can stop the people right but how do you stop the people that are so divided how do you bring humanity together to actually care about not ruining the world I think that's what we're talking about here. It's a difficult thing to do considering we are in one of those eras where we have, I think, three or four different generations existing at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> so how do you make uh, people that face so many disparities agree on one thing, or at least agree to disagree and come up with a solution? that can help humanity to, to just care about not ruining the world using technology. How does Africa look in the next five years, in your opinion? Or what does it look like? I think because I'm an optimist, I think hopeful. I have a lot of uh, hope and faith in the continent. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities here um, and I think it's up to Africa's young people to actually stay here. If people do stay here and don't migrate and don't leave, I think we have a lot of opportunities and a lot of leverage to, to um, advance innovation. I don't know if we'll be able to, to catch up or leapfrog, um, but I think we may be able to do a little bit more than just leapfrog. Yeah, we have the natural resources. We have really talented people. We have hardworking people. Um, I think we, we're also starting to, you know, push the, the digital ne needle. So more and more people have access to, to telecom products, have phones. Uh, more and more people have electricity. I think, I think, yeah, I have a lot of faith and hope in the continent the next five years. Jana, thank you. I think that, um, firstly, I want to acknowledge you for the work that you're doing. I think that we need more people and more Janets in this world who are a voice for what a good world should look like. 
impact spe- specifically in Africa and like you said it starts with the youth and how there's potential here for so much good yeah. so thank you for doing the work that you're doing and keep keep on going and i think that um the more janets out there doing incredible things i think that ai will be good and mm. not cause mass destruction as Definitely. a lot of people are predicting um so thank you